Dr. Tom Sanicandro is the director of the Institute for Community Inclusion. He's been a legislator, he's an attorney, he's a parent of a child with special needs. So thrilled to welcome Tom to our place here today. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, I am honored to be here. Thank you, Rich, for inviting me here. It's my privilege to speak to you folks. I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm also thrilled to be half of the keynote address today. The other half is my former colleague from the State House and my longtime friend, Melissa Riley, who is going to be sharing the stage with you. So when Rich told me that I was going to be the keynote speaker with Melissa, I said, well, I have one request. I said, I want to go first, because I don't want to have to follow <laughs> Melissa. But the other side of that is he didn't tell me all these commissioners would be so spectacular and he was going to give out these awards. I feel like there's a lot of pressure already, Rich, so thank you. No pressure. No pressure. Just push that. You'll thank you. Thank you. I actually, um, as Rich said, I was in the legislature and an elected official for a long time. Um, but I never really quite got the hang of this speech thing. So I have, um, I have a prepared speech and I'm hopefully I've got everything in order here. Um, really, this is my honor to speak to you folks today. And I was thrilled to see when that question was asked, how many were first time people here? Um, when, as I was preparing for this speech, I spent a lot of time thinking, you know, there's so many things I wanna tell folks about the area of disability, disability policy, empowerment, how do we move ahead? I try to think of what is the most important message that I wanna give. Um, and that's what I'm gonna try to do today. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Um, one of the reasons why I was excited to be asked to speak today is, as Rich said, I'm the parent. I have a 33-year-old um, son who has Down syndrome. And in the very early days um, after my son was born, when my wife and I were trying to figure out the path ahead, we had a lot of folks that helped us. Um, we went to a lot of conferences like this. We heard from a lot of speakers that really began to shape the way I thought about our path forward and the path forward for my son. Among them actually is Rich Robertson, who's been doing this work for quite a while and very impressive. So thank you for all your work, Rich. So I want to have a better feel for who's in the audience. Um, how many are special education advocates in this room? And how many are teachers? And how many are um, professionals in the school system, whether they're therapists or social workers? And then how many are parents? <laughs> I think I found the dynamic. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you here. And how many are students? I just finished being a student myself, so. Thank you all for being here. Um, and hopefully, um, I know you'll learn things during this conference, and hopefully I can share some information with you. Um, one of the things that I want, or what I want to talk about today I want to talk about two areas. One is I want to talk about the research. I am now the head or the director of the Institute for Community Inclusion here at Children's Hospital in UMass Boston. And as a result of that, I'm around a lot of researchers and I see what the research is. Um, one of the things I want to do is bring you two pieces of research for you to think about. The next thing that I think is critically important, and I was glad to see there was a lot of first time people here, is to talk a little bit about where we are in history. I think the contextual matter of where we are in history today, I think a lot of folks don't fully appreciate. And I think it's important for us to appreciate that point in history where we are, 
so that we can understand better how to move forward. First, um, let's talk about the research. Um, like I said, I've had the privilege to work and study with some of the best disability researchers in the country, if not in the world. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Developmental Evaluation Clinic or the Down Syndrome Clinic at Children's Hospital. Yes, that's part of the Institute for Community Inclusion. And we have Angela Lombardo here as well, who heads up that for the Institute for Community Inclusion. Um, we also do cutting edge research in the area of employment for people with disabilities. Um, we do that work in every state in the country, as well as 11 other countries. Um, and many of you have probably heard of Think College. How many have heard of Think College? Good, because now I have something to tell you. Yes, some of you are, know about that. Um, Think College helps create programs, inclusive programs, for students with intellectual disabilities to attend colleges and universities all across the country. We are the lead in that area. So, since I've come to the Institute for Community Inclusion, I've learned a whole lot of different things. And probably the most important information I've learned is the importance of expectations. I remember um, as a father of a young son with Down syndrome, bringing him to a hospital in Boston right after his birth, and this was in the mid 80s, um, to find out what this Down syndrome thing was all about. Um, my wife and I had no idea. We really never met anyone with Down syndrome. And at the time, in the 80s, we were in a different world. Um, we met with a specialist, a pediatrician in Boston, um, who was supposedly one of the most renowned. Um, all I remember from that visit is her explanation of all the things my son would not do. That he would not crawl or walk on time, that he would not speak on time, that he um, would have trouble potty training, that would be delayed. And then she told us about the nevers that he would never do. I'm playing to the right crowd here today, I can see. Um, he t she said he wouldn't ride a two-wheel bicycle. He would never drive a car. Um, the entire focus of the visit was this deficit, all the problems and all the things my son would not do. There was no mention of his potential, of where his strengths would lie, of how much he could add to our family and our society and our community. The other part of this is that she was wrong about a lot of the things that she said, which sort of began us questioning the validity of anything she had said. <laughs> um, first off, My son did potty train at the appropriate age, which I'm glad he's not here to hear this. <laughs> um, but my wife and I were very happy with that as well. Um, he did ride a two-wheel two bicycle, and he actually began riding it at about the same age as every other kid began riding a two-wheel bicycle. And then I remember clearly my wife asking about driving. And I don't know why she had this concept of driving. But my son now has a driver's license. So one of the areas we research and we talk about and has become clear to me over this last year that I've worked for the Institute 
is this importance of expectations. Um, social science research, and this research is kind of funny because um, I, we have 40 PhDs, um, 60s master's level people all researching this stuff. Um, and a lot of things they come up with is exactly what everybody in this room would tell us anyway. <laughs> but it's important to document that. I know there's some professors in the audience that feel that this science is important, um, but they do that. So what they've come up with is that these types of encounters are bad. Go figure. <laughs> really what is critically important is that you're meeting with professionals, whether they be in the, the physician's office, whether they be with therapists, they, whether they be with your school, whether they be with the administration of the school, the focus should be on the strength and the potential of all children. We need to have high expectations of our children, in ourselves, in our community. The other side of this, and someone had mentioned this earlier, I think it was one of the commissioners who sort of let it out. Um, as an elected official, one of the things that I, the, the power that you folks all have, both collectively and individually, the power to affect policy is huge. That one person who raises an issue can actually control the issue, particularly here in Massachusetts where we're in a relatively confined area. So on the area of expectations, you need to keep those expectations high for your elected officials and in your administrators. You need to expect that, and you need to demand that. Yes. The other area I want to talk about, and I'm glad that there were a lot of folks that didn't know about this, ex except I see some folks that have um, been able to take advantage of this, is a lot of the work that we're doing, a major part of the work we're doing at the Institute for Community Inclusion is including students with intellectual disabilities in higher education. The research that we have shows that the earlier the parent and the child consider college, the more likely it is to happen. Does anybody in this room have a child in elementary school or before? You need to consider college and life and a career for your children. Many times if, if you have a child with a disability in those conversations with professionals, that conversation never comes up. But if the child is a typically developing child, that conversation always comes up. Our children are no different than any other child. And will have the same career opportunities as everyone else. One of the things that I, you know, I have in my comb says, don't believe me. Um, Presenting with me today is Melissa Riley. Like I said, um, she's gonna present the second half of the keynote today. She was my former colleague at the Massachusetts State House. Um, she holds a professional position there as a staffer for a state senator. Um, and 
what helped her get that position was that she uh, was her college education that prepared her for that position. Um, and I just wanted to, I'm very proud of Melissa as well, um, but this is actually a, a photograph of Melissa testifying um, before the Labor and Workforce Committee at the Massachusetts State House. I think this was about a week ago, um, that she was testifying in her professional capacity as a staffer of a state senator. So when you talk about expectations, think about Melissa Riley, and think about everything that opportunity has brought. The next area of research that's come out is, is not particularly from us at the Institute for Community Inclusion. Um, as I was preparing for this, I knew it, it's something that's happening over and over again in um, businesses, um, at every level of business. And actually, I, of course, doing my research for this, hit the old Google thing. Um, but, and the first article that popped up was um, a Harvard, Harvard Business School case study looking at diversity and how important that is in, um, in any organization. Diversity is now emerging as a way for a business to be more successful. Diversity usually um, refers to racial and ethnic diversity. And as we are going through this, we're learning that neurodiversity and ability is equally as important to these boards as we move ahead. For the Institute for Community Inclusion, we, of course, believe in diversity, and all kinds of diversity as we move ahead. So we are in the process of doing what's called a, called a strategic plan, where we're bringing the organization together to figure out what we're gonna be doing for the next five years and how we move ahead. Um, as we were looking at assembling a steering committee, a small group of um, folks to help us work through this, one of the issues was the issue of diversity. Um, we have a woman who's on that steering committee um, who has an intellectual disability. And in the first meeting of the steering committee, as we're moving ahead with a consultant, she raised her voice and said, and began talking about the importance of plain language. As when we're moving ahead, she said, you absolutely need to make sure everything is in plain language so people can understand it. And I, being the new guy in the room, I absolutely agreed with her because I don't know half the time what they're talking about there. <laughs> But it was her impact and input that is going to change the way our organization moves ahead in the future. And it's going to make us a much stronger organization. And I just need to, now I need to sort of shift gears a little bit. This is all related, but I, and I've, I just feel like I have to give so much information, I really want to do it. Um, one of the issues that we have, and Rich started with this today, which I was really glad um, for, is to talk about education. And, and I believe the commissioner brought this up as well, uh, talking about human rights. Education is a civil right. It is our responsibility, all of us, to make sure all of our students are prepared for adult life. All our students need to be thinking about being prepared for college, being prepared for work, being prepared to be civilly, civically engaged in their communities. Um, this is the charge of everybody in this room and that's why we're here today is to better prepare us and ourselves as we move ahead with that charge. One of the challenges, and I know there's, there's lots of parents, lots of first timers here, um, 
like Rich said, I, I um, practice in the area of special education law um, for about 17 years. And as a uh, special education lawyer and as a dad um, who shows up at these team meetings, and many of you who have been this, through this process, and especially the, the special education advocates that are here, um, sometimes you wonder a bit, did I go too far? Did I ask for too much? Did I push the envelope too far? I understand my local community is strapped for cash. Am I asking for too much? No. <laughs> and the reason for the no isn't the child you're working with or your child or even yourself if you're advocating your, for yourself. The reason the answer is no is because we're not just fighting for that child in front of you or our child. We're fighting for every child and we're fighting for the future of our community. The challenge is, and this is the history part, which sort of people blur over a bit, but I think it's important to talk about. Um, and as time goes on, I've become one of the older people in any room. Um, and I think it's important for us to share that history because it's really pretty rapid where we are. Um, I can start in Roman times, but <laughs> it's usually not well received. So I'm only gonna restart in colonial times. Um, perfect. <laughs> I've got five minutes to wrap this up. So in colonial times, what they did, if you had a disability, the way they figured out how to go ahead was they would, they would call bidding it out. So everyone who had a disability, other people in the community would bid on what they would charge to support that person for the next year. The challenge was that the bid out always went to the lowest bidder. The reason why I bring that up today is we move into the budget process and we're not completely through the budget process yet in Massachusetts, is that a lot of the mentality about bidding out still exists today. Special education, disability services are somehow put backwards. And if you've ever been to a local school committee meeting or a selectman's meeting or a town meeting member, there gets to be the, the question of why are we paying all that money for those kids? That comes from the same bidding out. Quickly moving through, um, we had institutions that we created in this country um, during the Industrial Revolution that existed and still exist here in Massachusetts, not used the same way. Um, but it was a point to segregate folks from society. Those only began to break up in 1970. Like Rich said, special education law in Massachusetts was passed in 72. A few of us in this room were around in 72, in school or out of school already in 72. Um, so it hasn't been that long that we've been fighting for these rights. Um, segregation, in this, I think one of the things to, uh, to remember is that prior to special education law, there was no right to an education at all for an individual with a disability. That's why you're fighting. Prior to, to the special education law, there was no right to an education for a person with a disability. We can't even fathom that today, which is good, but it's important to remember. Um, the world has changed dramatically because of education um, and partially because of the special education law. We now have three generations of students who needed special education services who have been educated with their typically developing peers. That has changed the world. We are seeing, we, I saw at the State House and we continue to see advocacy by people with disabilities and intellectual disabilities coming before us and changing the law. The Real Lives Bill. Um, <laughs> G 
changing the name of the department. Um, even the inclusive concurrent enrollment program, including students with intellectual disabilities in college, was all led from the community of people with intellectual disabilities themselves because they were educated and prepared to go ahead. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do all of this, but I will jump. My final words to you are be vigilant in this process. Remember when you're fighting for yourself or your child or someone you're representing, that you're not just there representing them. This is about us as a community coming together and bringing our best foot forward. So be vigilant in your work. Um, thank you all for being here and thank you for inviting me.